pray together. In your language, pray.
hear, listen, receive. Don't just hear. Don't just listen. Don't just receive. Halakha. Walk.
So usually we would read through the text first in a traditional English version, uh, but tonight we, we don't have time for that. So I'm just going to go straight to my translation of the text and just remind you once again that this translation is combining the three languages, the Aramaic, the Hebrew and the, the Greek, so that we get a convergent meaning. Because we have this difficulty with the fact that our oldest New Testament manuscripts come to us in Greek. However, the New Testament is entirely written by Jews. So we have Jews thinking like Jews, writing in Greek. Uh, sometimes, though, it's difficult then to understand the idioms in Greek. And so if we then look at the Hebrew translation of the Greek, we can start to get a fuller idea. And if we look again to the Aramaic, which is the next oldest text, there's stuff there that just helps illuminate the the meaning. We don't change the meaning, we just really tease out the fullness of it. And that's what I'm trying to do with the type of translation that I've done. Uh, so we're going to just go through verse at a time or so, and I'll just um, give you some, some information, and then at the end we'll give you an opportunity to ask questions or make comment or devotional observation uh, and we'll pass the mic around. There is a, a handheld mic there that we'll pass around at the end when I'm finished. So Habesorao uh, Piochanan, the gospel according to John, uh, that is the disciple of Yeshua, chapter 13 and starting with verse 1 and we're just going to go through to verse 20 tonight. Actually, why don't I read both? I'll read the NASB and then I'll read my translation. So the NASB says, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Okay, so that's the NASB, fairly standard, uh, so-called literal version in English. So now the translation. Moreover, before the festival, and remember that Yohanan or John is the only gospel writer to call Passover, well, in Greek it's slightly different, but he still says the festival. Okay, so in Hebrew, hachak, the festival. Now, generally speaking, First century Jews would not have called Passover the festival. They would have called Yom Kippur the festival. And that's still true today, really. Passover was important, but it wasn't called the festival. So John's take on this is unique. And that's because his entire gospel is focused on Yeshua as the Lamb, meaning the Pesach Lamb of God, and Yeshua as God with us. And you see that throughout his gospel. So this is why he uses this language. So the festival of the Passover, Yeshua seeing, perceiving. Notice the difference. The English text says knowing. But actually the Greek does not say knowing. It says seeing or perceiving. Okay, there's a different Greek word for knowing. And that's used later on in the text. But it's important to understand the distinction the writer of this gospel is intending a clear distinction between the two types of understanding. One is seeing and perceiving. The other is an, an in-depth or an intimate, intrinsic knowledge. Okay? Um, so he was perceiving that his certain definite time, fixed season, hour, had come in which he would pass over. So the Greek word literally means pass over. So when he would pass over from this world to the advantage of the Father, having entirely loved those belonging to him who were in the world, he entirely loved them toward the taxing goal. So the, the meaning in, in the Greek and the Hebrew, the other languages that we're converging here, just slightly illuminates what's going on, doesn't it? Because in our text, in our standard text, 
the scripture says, his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Hey. But I don't know about you, but when I hear the word, the English word end, to me, that's the stop point. Okay? <laughs> we're done. But actually, the Greek talos can also mean goal. Okay, so if we use the ancient English and say end as in the, end, the means to an end, then we're using it rightly. It's a goal. So he says, so the scripture says, he entirely loved them toward the taxing goal. So whatever he was about to do was meant to point them toward his death, resurrection, and ascension. The taxing goal that was before him. Okay, so we're going to read the next verse. And so the standard text, During supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, and then there's the next verse, but I want to pause there. So then the translation, during the formal evening meal. That's what the Greek means. So he wasn't just coming for a social dinner. It was a formal meal. And, and if the Greek is saying it's a formal meal, it's highly likely that, in, that infers a religious practice of some kind. Now people do debate as to whether or not this was a Seder meal. Uh, a lot of Christian scholars say no. But given the other gospel accounts and the way they tell this part of Yeshua's earthly story, it seems very likely that this is a Seder meal. And how that works is that in the first century, uh, post-exilic Jews had brought, brought back with them this tradition of two Passover Seders. In fact, we still practice two Passover Seders in the Diaspora. Not in Israel, but in the Diaspora. And it's to do with not being able to know for certain when the festival falls based on, you know, the cycle of the moon and so on. And, and so it's highly likely that this tradition of two Seders was in operation amongst some Jews during the first century. If that's the case, then this is likely one of two seders that Yeshua participated in. Um, if it's not the case, at very least this was a formal meal that was organised to honour him in some way. So, during the formal meal, the devil, Hasatan in Hebrew, the accuser, having already put into the inner being the heart of Yehuda, that's Judas, Yehuda, Ishkayot, which, which meant man of this town, Kariot, which is uh, part of the towns of the tribe of Judah. The son of Shimon, interesting that Shimon means heard or listened to or received and walked in, as uh, Shimshon rightly said earlier, from the word Shema, to betray him. Seeing, perceiving that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had originated from God and was going back to God. Okay, and then what happens next? The point here is that Yeshua had been given all things. So that at this point, he was entirely able to choose not to do what he was sent to do. And in reality, were that not the case, then what he did wouldn't have been worth what it's worth. And he says elsewhere that no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down and I have the power to take it up. And that's very important. Um, and so... Knowing all this, and toward the taxing goal, he enacts this living mashal, this living parable, this living teaching example, which we've seen tonight quite literally in front of us here. But it did have a deeper meaning to the Jewish people than what we've so far understood tonight. 
He got up from supper and laid aside his garments and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Okay, so he washed feet. And that's very humble, obviously. It's also very nice. So now the conclusion that most theologians come to is this was the job of the lowliest servant. That's correct. The lowliest servant of the household. So in the first century, well-to-do Jewish families would have had three servants. And the toilets and the feet washing were the job of the lowliest one. So that's next level humility, right? It's not just humble, it's next level. You're the toilet washer guy. Okay, so that, that is true. What they then suggest is that this is the washing of the feet because the dirt of the road is on the feet. This is what's suggested. They're wrong. They're wrong. The dirt of the road is not being washed off the disciples' feet. How do I know this? He rose from the formal meal. When do you wash off the dirt from the feet? After everyone sat down to eat their meal? Or before when they come into the house? So the servant had already washed the dirt of the road off the feet of everybody. And they had sat down to this formal meal. Their feet were clean. This changes the way we see the rest of this text entirely. Because the Greek, in fact, uses language that can be used not just for washing, but for ritual washing. <clears throat> this is really special stuff. It's why I'm getting passionate here and losing my voice. Ritual washing means that this takes on a whole different meaning, okay? He put aside his garments, that is his outer clothing, and there's a specific Greek word for that, for the outer clothing. And that's why that word is used. In taking a towel, he girded himself, then he poured water into the basin and began to ritually wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So I've explained that this word is used for ritual washing, right? And I've explained that this wasn't washing the dirt off. This was something else. Okay. Um, and the next thing we need to understand is that Yeshua has taken off his outer clothing. So what's he wearing? Don't say nothing. Yeshua, <laughs> disciple calendar, 30 CE. Okay, he was wearing a, a gar an undergarment without a seam. A seamless undergarment. And if you know the scripture, you know that at the crucifixion, the soldiers divided his outer clothing four ways, but that they gambled over who would get the seamless undergarment, an undergarment like the garment that the priests wear. So Yeshua has stripped off his clothes down to a priestly garment is what's happened here. That's very important um, because if we look at the scripture and we look at the Torah Shemot or Exodus 30, 17 to 21, we read this. Adonai spoke to Moshe saying, You will also make a basin of bronze with a bronze stand for washing. You are to place in between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. Ahawan and his sons are to wash their hands and their feet. Whenever they go into the tent of meeting or come near to the altar to minister, to present an offering made by fire in smoke to Adonai. They are to wash with water so that they do not die. They are to wash their hands and their feet. 
so that they do not die. It is to be an eternal statute for them, to him and to his offspring throughout their generations. So what we know about Yeshua retrospectively is that he is the, well, not retrospectively, actually the prophets, the prophets of Israel tell us long before the uh, Kohen or the priest that wrote Hebrews does, long before the prophets of Israel tell us that he will be in the order of Melchizedek, my king of righteousness. Right? And he will be the priest of priests. So what he's doing here as the priest of priests is he's washing the feet of a priesthood. A holy people, a royal, a royal nation, a people belonging to God. Why? He's preparing them to approach the sacrifice of all sacrifices. His death on the cross. He's preparing them to minister as priests, first and always first to the Yehudim, the Jews, and also always to the nations. That's what's happening here. He's doing what was done to the sons of Aaron, but he's doing it under his priesthood having united the priesthood and the kingship of Israel in his immersion, in his baptism. So he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? What are you, Meshuggah? You're the rabbi, you're the master, the teacher. You're going to wash my feet? Isn't Shlomo around here? Shlomo! Jesus answered and said to him, What I do, you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Right? You and I know now. 2020, right? Hindsight. Yeshua was putting a mental marker into Shimon Kefar's head. What I'm doing, you don't get now, but you will hereafter. And so, boom, it's in his head. Now, hereafter, there's going to be a point where Shimon goes, Oi, voila. What a gift from Yeshua. How much do we not get now? He's saying to us, you're going to get it hereafter. You don't get it now. But you will get it hereafter. I'm seeding that idea for you right now. So he came to Shimon Kifan. I mean, really, his name means hears or listens, receives the rock. That's what his name really means. Who said to him, Adonai, do you wash my feet? Yeshua answered and said to him, what I do, you do not perceive, recognize now. Notice that same word, Ido. It's actually Hebrew. Ido is a prophet of the Torah. But in Greek, it means to perceive, to recognize, to see. Now in this moment, but you will know. Different word. Inosco. You will know. Now you don't perceive, then you will know. Hereafter, okay. Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. Good for you, buddy. He's the rabbi, man. The rabbi is not washing my feet. He's the rabbi. I need to show him respect. He's the, the teacher, the master. Shucks, I even think he might be the Mashiach. There is no way I can let him wash my feet. Yeshua practices some tough love, doesn't he? It's because he loves Shimon Kefar that he's harsh with him. Yeshua, Jesus answered, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. What the? 
Simon Peter said to him, you got to love this guy. My man. Simon Peter said to him, oh, shucks. You really made me feel bad about my stuff. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to leave for a bit. You've really hurt my feelings. <laughs> Straight back at him. Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. This guy is boots and all for you, sure. I don't care what you say about this brother. That's chutzpah right there, man. Am ha'aretz. Am ha'aretz. Kephar said to him, you will never wash my feet. Yeshua answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Shimon Kephar, without skipping a beat, says to him, Adonai, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Remember in the last chapter, Yeshua was saying that his disciples should walk in the all-existing light. What the feet do? Feet walk. In the all existing light, hopefully, if that's the choice you make. So, hands, they act in a different way. And the head is the authority over the body. So, Peter's not just pointing out two random other things, he's saying, let the walking of my faith. And the action of my hands and the governance over my body be subject to you. And Yeshua, because he rocks, Yeshua said to him, He who has bathed, and the Greek word means completely bathed. Okay? He who is bathed, washed the whole body, needs only to ritually wash his feet. Moreover, he is completely clean, pure. And you are clean, pure. Okay, Peter's not crying anymore. I don't, he wasn't ever crying, was he? He did. You know what I notice about Shimon Kefar? He wasn't a victim. He didn't say, woe is me, everything's been done to me, the world's defeated me, I, I might as well defeat myself. That's called victim mentality, it's prevalent in our age. But in Messiah we are more than conquerors, we are not victims. And then he says, but not all of you. Because he knew that Yehuda, that Judas, was already getting ready to betray him. For he saw the one who was betraying him. And for this reason, he said, not all of you are clean, pure. So when he had ritually washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know? And that's that other word for knowledge, not to see and perceive, but to know in your inner being. Do you know what I have done to you? You call me the teacher, Hamore, and the Lord, Hadon, Adonai. And you are right, for I am. If I then, the teacher, the Lord, ritually washed your feet, you also ought to ritually wash one another's feet. It's what we did tonight. We obeyed the instruction. Ritually wash your feet. You also ought to ritually wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Yes, he means we should humble ourselves to one another. Yes, absolutely. He does mean that. Because remember, this is done by the lowliest servant of the household. 
So yeah, he means humble yourselves to one another. But guys, what about what we now know? How does that apply? What it means is, Yeshua as high priests has washed the priests of his priesthood, the Talmudim, and he is saying, honour one another in the same way. Therefore, they are honouring each other's what? Priesthood when they wash each other's feet. They are acknowledging, brother, you are a priest. Sister, you are a priest. And that is being returned to them. Because he says, do it for one another. Just as I've done. Amen, amen. Be'emet, be'emet. It's the truth, it's the truth. Twice means firmly established. Firmly established truth. It's certain, it's certain. I say to you, a bond servant is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you see, perceive and recognize these things, you are blessed if you do them. No matter how many times you walk in the Lord's will and act accordingly, you will never, praise God, be greater than Yeshua. And Yeshua gave the example of submitting himself to the Father so that we would understand the way the Godhead works and therefore the way our relationship with the Godhead works. Because remember what we read earlier? God had given some things. God had given all things into his hand. Wow. I don't speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but that the writing may be fully filled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel upon me. And obviously this is a quote from Psalm 41. Um, 10 or 9, depending on whether you're reading the Goy Bible or the, the Hebrew Bible. And lifting up his heel against me is an ancient biblical Hebrew idiom, meaning that such was the pride of the individual that they saw themselves as greater than the one they were betraying, hurting, or doing something, fighting against. That's what that means. So, you know, some people say, oh, poor Yehuda. You know, he was doomed from the start. What this is saying is that his pride was such that he was almost at the point where he could have seen himself as Messiah. That's what lifting up the heel against me really is inferring. Now, did he have an opportunity to, to repent? Of course he did. God is just. And I don't know. I'd say you'd have to be pretty darn repentant to hang yourself, but that's just me. Um, but the point is that at this point, there was great pride involved. From now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, you may believe, trust, be persuaded that I am, and it's the same ego in me, I am statement that is elsewhere in Yohanan's Gospel. And it means deity, Immanuel, with you, God. Immanuel. So he's saying, listen to it carefully then, if it means that he's identifying as God with us, from now on I am telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, that is my death, my resurrection, my ascension, you may believe, trust, be persuaded, seed in your head, in this moment, telling you now, so that when it happens, you go, ah. So that you will trust, believe, be persuaded that I'm a good teacher, that I'm a good rabbi, that I'm just a righteous human leader. 
So that you will trust and be persuaded that I am the manifest God of the universe with you. Immanuel. Amen. Amen, amen. Be'emet, be'emet. In truth, in truth. It's certain, it's established, it's immutable. That's a really flash, theological type word that real smart people use for nothing's going to change it. Why can't theologians just be Westies? It would be much easier. <laughs> I say to you, the one who receives whomever I send receives me, and the one who receives me receives him who sent me. And elsewhere, Yeshua says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But listen to what's happening here. I'm sending you Talmudim, and anyone who receives you, it's as if they have received me. And you're going to be washing each other's feet. So whoever receives you is going to take on board what you've taken on board, that they too have become priests whose feet have been washed, and they will wash each other's feet. And if they've received you, they've received me. And if they've received me, as you have, you've received the Father, and so on and so forth. And throughout the ages, and 2020, in Henderson, New Zealand, we have received those who brought the message of the gospel to us. They have respected us as priests, and we have respected them back as priests. And now we have one another, priest to priest, washing to washing. We have received each other and therefore have received Yeshua and therefore have received the Father. You and I. The Talmud Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud, says, The messenger of a man is as himself. And Yohanan, the writer of this gospel, in one of his letters, says this, Whoever claims to abide in Yeshua must walk as Yeshua did. And the disciple must take another step, walk in my all-existing light. And so relationship begins. Not a ticket to heaven or a ticket to the world to come, but an entering into perpetual relationship. Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, whoever claims to abide in Yeshua must walk as Yeshua did. Amen. Amen. Amen.